video I'm going to discuss the planetary cameras from ZWO that are on the market today. Let's go! This is part 2 of my videos about astrophotography cameras. In my first video last week I promised to discuss astrophotography cameras on the market today. As there are currently over 300 astrophotography cameras from different vendors, I decided to make several videos about these cameras, starting with planetary cameras released by ZWO first. In next week's video I'll talk about astrophotography cameras for deep sky astrophotography. Now, Of course there are lots of brands besides CWO like QHI, Altair, ATIG and others and I highly advise you to do your own research in this respect. In this video I'm going to use a lot of terminologies that I explained in my previous video about astrophotography cameras. So if you haven't done so already I recommend you first watch my part 1 video on astrophotography cameras first. You can find the link in the video description below along with links to the planetary cameras I will be discussing in this video. Also I have created a separate table with all the ZWO astrophotography cameras on my website astroforumspace.com where you can filter and compare these cameras. So if you like numbers you're welcome to check it out. In my previous video I explained at length what I would be looking for when buying a planetary camera. Let me do a quick recap here. A sensor of 1 megapixel is already big enough to capture the planets as they are among the tiniest objects in the night sky. For planetary imaging you want an imaging scale of about 0.25 to 0.1 arc seconds per pixel to capture the best surface details from the planets under good seeing conditions. A high frame rate per second is better as we are going to take short videos of the planets and will end up with a higher number of frames when post processing these videos. Furthermore, low read noise and high quantum efficiency are important as the camera will be able to co detect and convert photons into a signal that is registered on the camera sensor. Finally, a high bit ADC and a high full well capacity will give us, give us a better dynamic range, meaning you'll get more variations between the darkest and brightest color tones that a camera can capture. I will discuss both uh, color and mono cameras. Color cameras are easier to use whereas you can get better results with mono cameras, but it will take you more effort and you will have to buy additional filters. If you're going to use a color camera, the general recommendation is to also use an infrared cut filter to get a good color balance. So let's first talk about the prices of all the color cameras for planetary imaging. The latest CWO models include the ASI 485MC and the ASI 482MC which were both released in 2021. The two cameras are currently priced at 399 US dollars at the time of this video. The ASI 462 color camera was released in 2020 and is currently priced at 299. Now some of the earlier models that are still available and popular among planetary imagers include the 120MC at 149, the 224 at 199, the 178 at 299 and the 385 color camera at 369 US dollars. If you're looking for the best value for your money, I would recommend to go with the good old ASI 224 color camera, as it is very favorably priced at 199 US dollars. The ASI 224 has a modest 1.2 megapixel camera, but that's good enough to capture the tiny planets in the night sky. Moreover, the camera has a maximum of 150 frames per second when you run the camera in 10 bits and about 64 frames per second when running in 12 bits, which is fast enough to capture the planets. The camera has a pretty high full well capacity of 19200 and a 12 bit analog to digital converter. The quantum efficiency peak isn't released by Sony but should be at least about 75% which is enough for planetary imaging. The 120MC is the cheapest camera but it has a lower resolution, a higher read noise and a low full well capacity. The newer cameras are great but they are $100 to $200 more expensive, for which you'll get a bigger field of view. Let's take a look at those now. Let's compare the five cameras on resolution and imaging scale first. 
you'll be getting the largest field of view with the Ace i 485 and 482 color cameras. Interestingly, both cameras offer the exact same view, but the imaging scale of the Ace i 482 is exactly two times higher. This matters if you want to achieve the recommended imaging scale for planetary imaging, which is 0.25 or sometimes even 0.1 arc seconds per pixel under good seeing conditions. To get to an imaging scale of 0.25, you'll need a focal length of about 2400 mm with the ASI 485 and about 4800 mm with the ASI 482 due to its larger pixel size. Now this is beyond the focal length of some of the biggest commercial telescopes like the C14. Now of course you can use an additional Barlow lens to get to the desired imaging scale, but it is nice when your telescope and camera combination is already close to that imaging scale in the first place. So a useful rule of thumb is that your f-ratio should be somewhere between 5 to 7 times the pixel size of your camera under good seeing conditions. Anything beyond that would just lead to blurry images of the planets. So for example, with a pixel size of 2.9, your f-ratio should be somewhere between f15 and f20 for planetary imaging. Now, if you don't understand the terminology I'm using here, I highly recommend you check out that other video first, like I told you. So the best of the rest in terms of field of view is the 178 color camera at a resolution of 3096 by 2080 pixels and a pixel size of 2.4. Now the 385 and the 462 offer the smallest field of view in this price range. However, this is not a deal breaker for planetary imaging as these sensors are still large enough to capture the tiny planets in the night sky when using an imaging scale of 0.25 or even 0.1 arc seconds per pixel. Let's move on to frame rate per second or FPS in short. FPS is a bit difficult to compare across cameras. Most vendors report a maximum FPS speed of each camera as a function of the maximum resolution of that camera. As this varies across cameras, lots of us will be comparing apples with pears when only looking at the maximum FPS as reported by vendors. For example, the 485 has a maximum FPS of 39, which appears to be quite slow. However, this is the FPS of the camera at its highest resolution of 3840 by 2160 pixels and an ADC output of 12 bit. The manual of the ASI 485 states that when scaling the resolution down to 1920 by 1080 pixels, the camera reaches a speed of 55 FPS and at a resolution of 1280 by 720, it increases to a maximum of 77 FPS. Moreover, the analog to digital converter also influences the speed of the camera. You can run these planetary cameras at 10 bit instead of 12 bit, which will further increase the capturing speed of the camera at the cost of some dynamic range. Anyhow, I checked the FPS across cameras at a similar resolution of about 1 megapixel, which is about 1280 by 720 pixels, and the 12 bit output. At that resolution and output, the ASI 462MC appears to be the fastest color camera at 96.5 frame rates per second, followed by the 385 at 85.2 FPS. However, the reported resolution of the 385 is somewhat lower at 1024 by 720 pixels. The 482MC reaches a maximum of 84.6 FPS, followed by the 485 at 77.4 FPS. The 178 appears to be the slowest at 64 frame rates per second, but the manual reports a somewhat higher resolution of 1280 by 960 pixels at 14 bit. When running that same camera at 10 bit, the maximum FPS jumps to a maximum of 120. Like I said, apples and pears. This being said, the ASI 462 does appear to be one of the fastest cameras in this bunch. So all cameras have a pretty low read noise. Most planetary imagers will use at least some gain in their planetary imaging sessions to lower the exposure time in order to get a higher frame rate per second. Most cameras drop below a read noise of 2 when applying a gain of at least about 100 or higher, and this is excellent. 
Now, the exception is the Azi 482, which has a higher read noise, probably due to its bigger pixel size. Now, the QA peak of all the cameras is in the 80 to 85% range, which is excellent for planetary imaging. The full well capacity is a bit higher for the 385 and the 482, as these cameras also have a bigger pixel size. Now, finally, all cameras run on the 12 bit analog to digital converter, except for the 178MC, which runs at 14 bit and should offer you a somewhat higher dynamic range, but at the cost of a lower camera speed. So, all in all, what is the best color camera for planetary imaging? Well, people always like to see a winner, and if you would force me to make a decision, I'd probably say the ASI 462 color camera that is currently available for $299. US the ASI 462MC is the cheapest camera of the five cameras in this price range, and also the resolution and the imaging scale is perfect for planetary telescopes such as the popular Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes to get to an imaging scale of 0.25 arc seconds per pixel. Now, it is a fast camera with an FPS of 96.5 at 1 megapixel running at 12 bit, and the camera has a very low read noise. Now, this camera is also one of the newer models released in 2020. Newer is not always better, but it has a couple of things like high conversion gain mode, which enables a wide dynamic range at higher gain levels. Now, this being said, the differences between the cameras are marginal in my opinion, and your priorities may be different. For example, if you're looking for a camera with a wider field of view to also capture bigger objects like the moon or the sun, uh, the newer ASI 485 model will give you the widest field of view and the cheaper ASI 178 is a good second. Also, if you have that beast of a 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with a 4000mm focal length, the ASI 482MC with a larger pixel size may be a good fit for you. So when looking at mono cameras, ZWO offers four options. The ASI 120 mono priced at 179 US dollars, the 178 priced at 299, the 290 also priced at 299, and the 174 mono camera priced at 599 US dollars. Now, interestingly, the newer ZWO color models for planetary imaging are only released as color versions and not or at least not yet as mono versions. Now, the four available mono cameras are also quite different in their specifications and price range, which actually makes it a bit easier to choose one. Now, all the cameras except the 178 are sold in mini versions as well, which can be used for auto guiding. Now, I'll be discussing the normal sized cameras for planetary imaging, uh, but the specifications of the planetary cameras are similar to the mini cameras. I wanted to mention this as it may be an option for you to buy a camera for auto guiding that you can also occasionally use as a planetary camera when the planets are in opposition. Now, I've included the minis in the overview table on my website for those who are interested. So let's start with the ASI 120 mono camera, which is the cheapest camera of the bunch. Now for that, you'll get a decent camera that is inferior to the other models, especially with respect to the higher read noise. Now the 120 offers the smallest field of view uh, with a one megapixel resolution of 1280 by 960 pixels and a pixel size of 3.75. So you'd need a 3000 millimeter focal length telescope to get to an imaging scale of 0.25 or a 1500mm focal length telescope with a 2x Barlow lens. Now the quantum efficiency is the lowest of the bunch with an estimated QE peak of 75%. So let's compare the ASI 290 and the ASI 178 mono cameras which are both priced at 299 US dollars. The ASI 290 offers the smallest field of view at a resolution of 1936 by 1096 pixels and a pixel size of 2.9. The ASI 178 offers a much larger field of view at 3096 by 2080 pixels and a pixel size of 2.4. For an imaging scale of 0.25 arc seconds per pixel, you need a focal length of about 2400 millimeters with the ASI 290 and a focal length of at least 2,000 millimeters with the ASI 178. 
Now the ASI 290 is faster than the ASI 178. The manual reports an FPS of 93.6 FPS at a resolution of 1280 by 960 pixels at 12 bit, which can be increased to 194 FPS running at 10 bit. The ASI 178 offers 65 FPS at 1280 by 960 running at 14 bit and 130 FPS when running at 10 bit. The 290 has a marginally better read noise and comes with a 12-bit ADC, whereas the 178 comes with a 14-bit ADC. Now both cameras have a QE peak of about 80% and a full well capacity that is quite similar at 15,000. Now if you'd force me to choose between the two, I'd say that the 290 is probably the best planetary camera of the two as it offers a faster frame rate per second. However, the 178 offers a wider field of view and a 14-bit ADC, which may be nice if you also want to catch larger images of the moon. Finally, the ASI 174 is priced at 599 US dollars. As the price is two times higher, it is not really in competition with the other mono cameras. So, what do you get with that price? Well, first of all, the largest field of view of all the mono planetary cameras. The resolution is only 1936 by 1216 pixels, but the pixel size is a whopping 5.86. So that is twice the pixel size of the ASI 290, for example. Now, to get to a critical imaging scale of 0.25 arc seconds per pixel, you'd need a focal length of about 4800 millimeters, which is mo more than most consumer-based telescopes can offer. Now, a more realistic scenario would be to use a 2x viral lens with a telescope that has a focal length of about 2500 mm to get to this imaging scale. Now, the ASI 174 offers an impressive 128 frames per second at a resolution of 1936 by 1216 at 12 bit. Now, this can be increased to 164 fps when running at 10 bit. Now, the read noise is a bit higher as compared to the cheaper cameras uh, and it offers a full well capacity of 32,000 which is about two times deeper than other cameras. Now, this is probably because the ASI has that larger pixel size. The QA peak is estimated to lie around 78%. I think that mono cameras for planetary options are quite varied. Do you want the cheapest camera out there? Go for the ASI 120. Do you want an excellent fast planetary camera? Go for the ASI 290. Do you want a camera that also offers a wider field of view and a higher ADC for some decent planetary images and perhaps also some nice moon pictures? Get the ASI 178. And finally, if you have that long 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope and money is not an issue, Get the ASI 174 for some excellent detailed moon and planetary imaging. I hope this video about planetary cameras was useful for you. If it was, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Next week I'll discuss deep sky astrophotography cameras, so I hope to see you again. You can find ways to support me in the video description below if you want to. Your help is appreciated so I can continue to create free videos about astrophotography in space like this one. Clear skies!